Hey guys, it's September 10th, 2017, and this is your episode 112 of At Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as usual are Megan Arms. Hello. Megan, who do you have there with you? I have my new graduate student, Hannah Hutchins. She's our graduate assistant in the Mizzou New Music Ensemble, and so she's coming from the University of Montana, where she did her undergrad. And she's a fan of the podcast, so I thought I would welcome her in uh, and ask her to do an episode with us. Hello, everyone. So nice to be here. (laughs) Cool, cool. Great to have you. And of course, Ben Charles here. Hey, everybody. Ben, I know you're smack dab in the middle of Texas and you're not affected by the hurricane, but is anything different there? Are you even having crazy weather or anything? We had just a little bit of rain, but nothing major at all. My house actually flooded a little bit a couple of weeks ago before the hurricane but it didn't flood during the hurricane (laughs) Um, but not hurricane related at all right yeah but then also i know now there's hurricane irma is hitting florida and i knew i i used to teach at florida atlantic university i went to university of miami and both campuses have canceled classes and have evacuated i saw university of miami said the earliest they're going to hold classes is september 19th so about a week um so yeah it's um it seems like quite the situation in Florida right now. Yeah, Laurel's on the road right now, and she says <clears throat> she's seeing all sorts of just a unusual amount of Georgia, Florida license plates in Tennessee. Okay. And I can tell you I stayed in Houston for Hurricane Ike, which was, I think, nothing like what is happening right now. Harvey Irma and I guess Jose is on the way so this will all be old news by the time the podcast airs but you know just thinking about our friends I know we all have friends and fellow musicians in Texas so yeah best wishes to all of you out there and we're hoping you're safe and comfortable and that everything's okay yeah I've been thinking I've been like trying to keep up with this as much as possible and checking the New York Times like (laughs) hourly (laughs) today at least and a couple times a day, the past couple of days. But the current title on the New York Times is Hurricane Turns On, South Florida, quote, about to get punched, end quote. So we're yeah. we're in the Keys now and um, kind of heading up uh, St. Peter's, up to St. Petersburg. So it's crazy. I mean, I've been thinking about natural disasters and, You know, tornadoes having a little bit of warning, earthquakes having no warning, and hurricanes having a lot of warning. (laughs) But, like, you know, a a warning for a hurricane is never enough warning. (laughs) You just can't. You don't know how strong it's going to be. But it's, I don't know, it's just really mind-blowing to think about. And we've got all three of these hurricanes happening. We also have earthquakes happening. And then we've got the forest fires happening in the West and I know one of the first things when I was talking to to Hannah about her hometown, she said Montana is on fire right now, <laughs> and it yeah. is right. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. that's my that happened in Utah too. Utah, the mountains would just yeah, forest fires was the big thing, wildfires. Do you uh, yeah. do you guys remember Pasek a few years ago when Hurricane Sandy hit? And uh, Nevoisha Zivkovic was going to do a performance with a bunch of international artists and like. All of his, he made it, but, like, all of his artist flights got canceled, and, like, they couldn't rehearse, and so he kind of, like, had to go up and kind of, like, hey, so I guess I'll play Eliash now. (laughs) Remember that. Yeah. It was fun to see him sweat a little bit. Yeah. (laughs) Well, guys, I should introduce our guest. So here also with us today is someone who joined the Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps in 2002, where he became the core percussion arranger and currently serves as the drum group leader. Also, for many years, he has performed with the amazing top-secret drum corps of Basel, Switzerland. He has performed many times with the major mil- at the major military tattoos and something called Fosnacht, where, if you guys remember, we talked a little about this on one of the Michael Eagle episodes, the one with Philip Ruscha. So I'm looking forward to hearing some more about that. He's also the chair of the PAS Marching Committee and a performing artist for Majestic and Innovative Percussion. So welcome and thanks for joining us, Mark Riley. Thank you all for having me. This is uh, an honor and I'm humbled to be a part of this podcast. Huge fan. Uh, It's our honor. 
Yeah, it's totally our honor. You guys, I don't know how we're getting this lucky having these guests. We must be doing something right for now or something. Because, <laughs> yeah, we're really lucky to have you. What's what's happening? What's new with you? What's going on? Uh, new things. It's always something new, right? As long as you're staying busy, that's a good thing. Um, the core itself is kind of at a, a downtime at the moment. We're taking a breath. We just came back from the Basel Tattoo uh, in July, went to July 30th. We had 10 days of shows, uh, played for roughly about 180,000 people. Um, it was really an incredible experience, but it's just been a crazy packed year. Uh, it started with playing for the inauguration this past January, and then February rolled around into March. My younger brother got married in Texas, so had a little trip to Texas. And then we went to Fosnock with a group of us from the Old Guard. And then kind of tagging along with the Fosnock trip, we went down to Rome and we ended up getting an exchange with the Swiss Guard. And crazily enough, it all worked out that our contact with the Swiss Guard got us an audience with the Pope. Uh, we did some playing for the Pope. And then we had this amazing trip to Basel this past summer. So the year has no been incredible. Big deal. <laughs> no big deal. Just playing for the Pope, playing for the president. No big deal. Yeah, it was one of those those things you, you always say, man, it would be cool if, and then when it actually happens, you start going, like, did that really happen? How did that happen? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so how does that work with the with the core? Was it the entire group that went, or is there a smaller segment, or like for some of the tattoos, was it just the drum line, or, or what's, what's the story? Sure. Uh, so the only time the core itself has roughly 70 performing members, uh, and the only time we go with anything that large is for the inauguration. Um, mm -hmm. So we had the large core out there for the inaugural, uh, but then when it came to Fosnock and going to overseas, that was a bunch of us taking personal leave. Um, so we went on our own on basically a holiday to go over and play. Uh, cool. But for the, the Basel Tattoo, we only could bring roughly 30 members because we usually have to keep half the group in Washington mm -hmm. if a White House arrival comes around or a state funeral, which is the other duty we have, which is when a president passes away. We also take care of the lying in state, things of that nature with the old guard. Right. And the old guard is the, fi the old guard fife and drum corps is a part of the old guard, right? True. And that's How what... Can you explain that? Sure. Um, definitely a misconception. A lot of folks hear the Old Guard and they think maybe just the Fife and Drum Corps. Uh, but the Old Guard itself is called the 3rd United States Infantry Regiment. Um, uh -huh. It's the oldest active duty infantry regiment in the U.S. So it was, it was um, formed in 1784 and it was modeled after George Washington's lifeguard. Um, so that's the, the reason why we exist the way we do today with the continental uniforms and things of that nature. But yeah, it's the same group that does the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, the U.S. Army Drill Team, the Quezon Platoon. It's all the same unit. The Fife and Drum Corps is just one company. Mm -hmm. And I understand your uniforms date back to, geez, uh, I forgot the date, but they were, they were back there. Yeah, the, the, the pattern is a Continental Musician uniform from 1784. Uh, it's the winter uniform. Uh, it's pretty brutal in the summer. <laughs> Three layers of wool and a wig and a hat and yeah. DC 4th of July heat. <laughs> well, this is great. It's great to get some of these terms again. And I wonder, we've, we've covered them briefly on the podcast before, but I do not think it would hurt to have them coming from you. Would you explain what the Basel Tattoo is, and then also what Fosnacht is. Sure. The Basel Tattoo is not something you get put on your skin. It's definitely not ink of any <laughs> kind. The military term tattoo is a call. Uh, they play tattoo at each military installation when essentially the soldiers were going to bed. Um, so it, it's a, it comes from a Dutch term called tap to or tap toe, meaning to shut off the taps. Uh, and this would have been an old term that would have been used. That means the the brewers or the tavern keepers would have turned off the taps, sending the soldiers back to bed. Um, so what that means now is that it's a military pageant or a military festival that celebrates the arts and how the, the military was one of the biggest pur uh, purveyors of the arts, and they still are. I think actually when it comes to... Um, to someone who employs artists, the military is still the largest in, in the country, um, performing military bands, army bands, choruses, orchestras of that nature. 
So yeah, the you're Baltic talking Sands. in Switzerland now, right? Well, this is in the in the U.S. The military actually has the largest bankroll for musicians. Okay. Uh, when he talks about active duty, reserve, National Guard bands. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So, um, and that's one of the things we're always trying to advocate for is why that's so important to have this relationship between the military, the community, and where that rubber hits the road is it the, it's with the arts mm -hmm. uh, and the musicians. So going to the military tattoo circuit, um, you have a scene that consists of, I don't know, it could be up to 100 military tattoos around the world. Uh, the granddaddy of all the military tattoos is the Edinburgh tattoo in Scotland. Uh, it's at the Edinburgh Castle. Uh, the second largest, I believe, is the Basel tattoo in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, but after that, there is, um, I think the largest one in the U.S. is in Virginia. It's the Virginia International Tattoo. It's in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, but, yeah, they have tattoos pretty much all over the world. What's the difference between a tattoo and a muster? That's a great question. <laughs> so I've never thought about that, but I'm no, curious. No. Uh, so in Fife and Drum, we have festivals called musters, and the largest one would be the Deep River Muster in Connecticut, mm -hmm. uh, and that is strictly for Fife and Drum Corps. Uh, so that's celebrating American-style fifer, fifers and drummers, where the, ball, mm -hmm. the tattoos are going to bring in brass bands, pipes and drums, potentially dancers, Highland dancers, that that type of thing. Everyone, yep. Yeah, exactly. Makes sense. Ben, I think you have a Facebook question there, right? Uh, yeah, we had a question from Ben Fraley about how do fife and drum traditions differ from region to region in the U.S.? And I guess you could also expand that to around the world. Sure. Um, we'll start with the U.S. That's probably the, the easier one. Yeah. Um, well, in today's kind of global world, a lot of things start to kind of look and smell the same. Um, you know, if you go to a place in Texas, you can have a Walmart and a Target, but then you can go up to Massachusetts and see kind of the same strip mall and have a Walmart and a Target. Uh, unfortunately, today, Fife and Drum, a lot of it is um, sounds very similar. Uh, there are a few groups in the States that still have a very distinctive sound. One of the groups is called Moodus from Moodus, Connecticut. They play about 60 beats per minute on 1812 Eli Brown drums or 1820 Eli Brown drums, completely unmuffled calfskin. Um, but so historically, if you go back, um, different regions in the States would have had different styles. So uh, historically speaking, I grew up in New York and there was a New York style of fife and drum. And that differed from Connecticut where Connecticut had a style of fife and drum and then Massachusetts Delaware, things of that nature, they would have all had their, their differing styles. And that would have come from the biggest teacher in the area. So whoever the teacher was, the head teacher in New York would have played the interpretation of a rudiment one way. The head teacher in Connecticut would have an interpretation of a rudiment another way, Massachusetts and so forth. So over the years, that interpretation got really more and more similar and like sounding. But if you go on YouTube and you look up the Frank Arsenal recording of the rudiments and you hear he plays kinetic at halftime, if you listen to the interpretation of how he plays a lesson 25, that would have been the Connecticut way of playing because that's, how, that's where he was from, was from Connecticut. Um, in New York, what they had was they called it zippy style or zippy drumming, where they would kind of crush down the interpretation of the drag rudiments. So just to say something of... Lesson 25, kind of keeping it as a strict 30-second note. In New York style, they would have squeezed it together, and kind of a little gap after the eighth note, squeezing in the 30-second notes, kind of making it a zippy sound. Um, this is also a little controversial because some people want to say, well, when I grew up, I didn't play it that way. I played it this way. But in Massachusetts... If you go, there's a place called Old Sturbridge Village, and there's a group there that plays very, very, in my opinion, accurate historical drumming. And it's very open sound. They call it the open style, where you almost played everything completely the same. So instead of da 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 or da 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 they would have something that would sound da 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 and it would be very open and rounded in kind of that older style that they still do up in Massachusetts in that that Sturbridge Village group. 
I, I like all of these because it sounds like all of them would drive the orchestral guys just freaking nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a violation all around for them. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you got, Megan? Well, Mark, you said that the style depends on the teacher, and I've seen your name a lot with, with your teacher, uh, Nick Atanasio. Exactly. Was he your teacher growing up and, or, or more of your adult life? Um, so it's actually, these are one of these funny stories where, you know, I'm not, I'm very humbled to be where I am, uh, at the old guard. I never thought I would get into the old guard. And then if I was just a guy on the end of the line, I would have been completely happy and content being a guy just hanging on. Uh, and then when I got to the old guard, there were a lot of retirements going on. Mm -hmm. And so to be put in the position to have influence over, you know, an organization or a drum line like this is just, it's kind of mind boggling when I look back on it. Um, but it's because when I study with Nick, um, he kind of became a surrogate grandfather to me. Mm -hmm. um, both my grandparents had passed uh, when I was relatively young. And so the summer between my seventh grade year and my eighth grade year, uh, my parents asked me if I wanted to take lessons with this, this drum instructor that I had in my first junior corps. Uh, and so Nick taught the first drum corps I was ever in. Uh, wow. That was they were down the street from my parents' house. I could hear them practicing from the backyard. And um, the drummers were, you know, we were either practicing or you weren't practicing. And they yeah. were very fed up if you were not practicing. And yeah. so I kind of knew Nick as this kind of crazy guy who would, uh, you know, get very passionate about people who practiced or didn't practice. And so when my parents asked me if I wanted to take lessons, I said, oh, yeah, that, that crazy old guy. And they're like, uh, no, I mean, that really famous guy from Brooklyn that played in the championship <laughs> drum course. <laughs> yeah. So I anyway, know, yeah, long story short, wow. I studied with Nick from eighth grade uh, up until college, uh, so all through high school, and uh, did the competition scene in fife and drum that still that doesn't really exist anymore, but mm -hmm. there used to be a state competition, and if you won the state competition, you'd go to a regional competition and then the, na the national competition. Wow, I didn't even know about I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Nick was, um, he was there in kind of my formative years on how I would think and how I was formulating how I thought of the world and things of that nature. And I think he actually taught me more about life through playing the drum than he actually did teach me about drumming. And he taught me quite a bit about drumming. Well, and he's still of, alive, right? He is. Uh, in November, he turns 95 years old. Wow. Still, still That's, together. That's amazing. Well, and speaking of your early years, I understand you started your rudimental training when you were really young, something like six years old. Is that right? So, yeah. Um, what's funny is the core I was with did not let you play drums until you played Fife first. <laughs> <laughs> so That's how it should be. <laughs> so I had to play Fife. learn the tunes. Exactly. Actually, if you look at the Drummer's Heritage by Frederick Fennell, he has a very specific comment about the rudiments and how they're supposed to be shaped with the melody from the very beginning. Yeah, you're exactly right. That's so awesome. I had to play, yeah, I played Fife for four years before I got to play any drums. So from the age of six till about 10, I played Fife. And then starting around 10, I played drums for a year. And then at 11 years old, I started playing underneath Nick. Well, guys, I was going to try something of, I guess it's not a new segment invention, really, because we've sort of done something like this before. But uh, in lieu of something too creative or not, I'm just going to call this, what's the sound? So what are you hearing right here? So this is probably a softball for you guys, because we've talked about this already. But you, of course, know what that is, right? Yes. Go for it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I don't want to be wrong. Okay, so, yes, that's that's my recording of Ligeti's symphonic poem for 100 metronomes. Hannah knew And that. it's funny hearing it without the video to me. It kind of sounds like one of those radiation Geiger meter things to me, because, the, the, I don't know, there's so much trouble in the recording. And... Of course, we've already talked about this a little bit on episode 107, so I'm not going to rehash what the piece is and all of that. But since then, in answering, trying to answer a student's question, I 
ran across some information and I thought I should uh, update you guys on what I learned. So after releasing this, uh, like I said, I'm digging around for some information to attempt to answer a student's inquiry about the piece regarding its creation and its purpose and just kind of like what it is. So if you Google around for, say, program notes on this piece, you'll likely run into a word fluxus. And you'll see that people are categorizing Ligeti's piece with something called the fluxus movement or the fluxus group. So, for example, quote, it was all part of his, meaning Ligeti, his rather brief flirtation with the fluxus or flow movement. Those are program notes on classical FM. Another one, quote, a concert which contained Ligeti's fluxus piece, Poem Symphonique, scored for 100 metronomes. And yet another one. Yorgi Ligeti's Poem Symphonique is a composition involving 100 metronomes and 10 operators fit right in with Fluxus during Ligeti's brief association with them. And then finally, Poem Symphonique is a 1962 composition by Yorgi Ligeti for 100 metronomes. It was written during his brief acquaintance with the Fluxus movement, and that's from Wikipedia. And actually, I usually defend Wikipedia. I kind of think Wikipedia is a really cool thing. Has that's like as a always changing, almost living encyclopedia. So I think that's really cool. But I found four other sites with this exact kind of phrasing. So it's definitely kind of taken as what this is. So, of course, a good question is, well, what is Fluxus? So, the Journal of Musicology, Volume 21, Number 2, Spring 2004, in an article by Eric Draught, titled Ligeti in Fluxus, he defines Fluxus this way, before it coalesced into a group, Fluxus was just a name, the name of a proposed publishing venture where the works of broad, inclusive, and international groups of avant-garde artists, composers, and poets would be anthologized. So, and now this is me talking, as far as the style of it, from what I can tell is a, a neo-data, absurdist, anti-performance art type of thing. So, Grove Music Online says it is historically inaccurate to call Fluxus a movement in its own right. I don't know how they come up with that. More on what it is, there's something out there called the Fluxus Workbook, and you can easily Google this and find it. This lists and describes many and likely most of what people call Fluxus works, what they're categorized as Fluxus works. Some of the composers that you may have heard of in the collection include George Brecht. He's usually the one people cite when describing what Fluxus is. Also, Dick Higgins, and one person who is really, really famous I don't know if anybody knows who the really, really famous... Hannah, do you know? Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Yoko Ono. Oh, dude, you nailed it. That's totally yeah. right. Yeah, that's great. How do you know that? Because I perused the workbook. <laughs> oh, have you really? <laughs> and I just saw the name Yoko Ono, and I went and I read through her um, pieces in it, and they are very interesting. Dude, give that girl a scholarship, Megan. I already did. <laughs> yeah, good work, good work, good work. So from yep. the workbook, some examples of these pieces written out. Here's just a couple from George Brecht, just so you guys get a sense of what it is. And I'm just going to read it to you. And this is basically what's replacing a, a published piece of music. You just have this description. So George Brecht's Drip Music, dated 1959, it just says, For single or multiple performance, a source of dripping water in an empty vessel are arranged so that the water falls into the vessel. That's it. And actually, you can find YouTube performances of this. It's literally people pouring water from one container into another, and that's it. So another one, three telephone events in 1961. When the telephone rings, it is allowed to continue ringing until it stops. When the telephone rings, the receiver is lifted and replaced. When the telephone rings, it is answered. And that is it. So Ligeti's piece is being called a Fluxus piece, along with two other pieces of his. One is called Three Bagatelles for David Tudor in 1961. Another one is called The Future of Music is a Collective Composition. And then the third is considered Poem Symphonique. I found the three bagatelles, and it's really just kind of a spacious, empty, John Cage-like piano piece. There's just a couple of notes sounding and then a lot of space. But it is notated. There are staffs, and it, it is notated like music, whereas Poem Symphonique is uh, just described. I'm not sure about the, fusic, the, the future of music is a collective composition. I couldn't find that one. 
So how is Palm Symphonique different? Well, back to the Eric Draught article in Ligeti and Fluxus, he has a quote from Ligeti that says, at the end of the 50s and beginning of the 60s came the happening movement from America. I was interested in an ambiguous way. I made some happenings. You know my piece for 100 metronomes, but I had the feeling that I am not a happenings person. You know the Fluxus group? I am not belonging there. After a long time, I had a feeling they take their job too seriously, and I am not serious like people like Lamont Young and George Brecht or even John Cage. I will tell you exactly what is between me and these happening people. They believe that life is art and art is life. I appreciate very much Cage and many people, but my artistic credo is that art, every art, is not life. It is something artificial. And for me, all the happenings are too dilettante. So remember, a dilettante means a person who cultivates an area of interest such as in the arts without any real commitment or knowledge, a dabbler, an amateur, a non-professional, a non-specialist, or a layman. So basically, Ligeti is saying that he, these guys are hacks, <laughs> is what he thinks, and that yeah. he does not consider himself one of them at all. Interesting. Any thoughts so far? I have more, but I feel like I'm already taking a long time. I, have... I think Hannah and I might just want to throw in our favorite ones from the from the workbook real quick. Can we do yeah. that? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Hannah. I've, I've, my favorite that I've come across, and there are a lot, and I have not read nearly all of them, but one of the Yoko Ono ones is called Fly Piece, and the text simply says, Fly, and it was composed in 1963. Yep. Um, I, I'm a fan of that one. I'd be interested to find some recordings mm -hmm. over here. I would, you know how I would do that one? I would get a fly in a jar and just <laughs> let it out. I would go skydiving. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I like Ken Friedman, restaurant event, dress as badly as possible, wear surplus <laughs> store clothes, tattered shoes, and an old hat, go to an elegant restaurant, behave with dignity and exquisite manners, request a fine table, tip the matra... Tip the martyr the well maitre d and well and take a seat. Order a glass of water. Drink the water. Tip the waiters, busboy, and staff lavishly. Then leave. 1964. So I had two things to add to this. One thing that that seemed to fit in the same vein as the metronome piece. Were you guys at Pasic a few years ago when they did the piece with the rice? I know that's really vague. Uh, it doesn't ring a bell. They they had this, uh, like, imagine a gigantic funnel full of dried rice, and they swung it back and forth, and the rice would, like, drip out. So there was this constant stream of sort of static noise, and then they would put different, like, pitched bowls underneath the rice, and so as the pendulum swung by, it would, it would briefly activate one of the pitches, so to speak, and they would sure, put them in sure. and out. But... All of this reminded me of something that I learned about in graduate school. Have you Are you familiar, familiar at all with futurism? Yeah. So this was an Italian movement, and it seems to maybe be sort of a predecessor to this. And it, it was all sort that you can read about Luigi Russolo and his ideas on futurism and instruments and all. But the sort of grandfather of futurism was a musician named Francesco Balila Pratella who was Italian, and I just wanted to quickly read his um, sort of manif manifesto of what he was going after. And long story short, he thought that Italian music, he was Italian, he thought Italian music was inferior to, to German music and other music abroad. So his musical program was for the young to keep away from conservatories and study independently, the founding of a musical review to be independent of academics and critics, abstention from any competition that was not completely open, liberation from the past and from well-made music, for the domination of singers to end so that they became like any other members of the orchestra, for opera composers to write their own librettos, which were to be in free verse, to end all period settings, ballads, nauseating Neapolitan songs and sacred music, and to promote new work in preference to old. So I thought that was a nice little tie-in to this similar idea. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. And I, I think my personal opinion, the, the metronome piece is certainly closer to futurism than Fluxus, yeah. in my opinion. And you know who else is a futurist is Zanakis. 
uh, especially in yeah. his architecture things and his drawings. He, he was a, he's a futurist more in the sense of a, another artist, not, not a musician. So, well, continuing on, I don't have much more here. So, okay, if it's not Fluxus, then what is it instead? Well, in searching, I picked up a little book from JMU Library titled Yorgi Ligeti of Foreign Lands and Strange Sounds. Uh, Wolfgang Marx and Luis uh, Deschano are the authors or the editors who collected these uh, essays uh, on Ligeti. So there's a chapter titled Continuum, Chaos and Metronomes of Fractal Relationships. So, of course, that's what I went right for in trying to answer this question. Now, Continuum is one of his famous piano pieces. And, of course, Chaos and Metronomes is referring to our poem symphonique. So this essay suggests that Ligeti's spark for poem symphonique came from his interest in fractal geometry and specifically mathematical chaos theory. The word fluxus does not appear anywhere within this whole article, uh, excuse me, this whole chapter. And as far as I could tell, it doesn't appear anywhere in the whole book. So... What's chaos theory? If you guys remember our interview, episode 98, we heard from Zoltan Rotz from Amadinda. Yeah, the very famous Hungarian of Amadinda Percussion Group. He talked a lot to me about Ligeti, and he speaks a lot about him in the interview. But I don't know if it was an interview or just he and I personally talking there in Taiwan. But he talks about working closely with Ligeti for many years and knew him personally very well. Zoltan told me once that Ligeti was knowledgeable and very interested in many, many, many things. He could speak intelligently, of course, about music, music history, history in general, politics, and mathematics. Chaos theory is suggested by this chapter in this book. And that, of course, makes so much more sense with the metronome piece in my mind because chaos theory is all about trying to predict something that is in a chaotic system based on its initial conditions. And the example they always go to is trying to predict the weather. So given the following initial conditions, we think the hurricane is going to land here. It may end up landing here, but we can approximate our guess, and that's what chaos theory is. So this, to me, makes a lot more sense because as I look through the Fluxus workbook, all those descriptions, they tend to be very simple and basic. And part of their manifesto is written that they want these pieces to be easy to perform and anyone can perform them. I don't think the Ligeti 100 metronomes is easy to perform. Right. You know, it has a lot of detailed description. There's a ton of information on how you're supposed to do it. And he really cares about how it's done and what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And there's just way too much detail. And there's way too many logistical challenges with gathering all the metronomes and all of that. So anyway, I thought that was worth sharing because a lot of times information is uh, wrong. And it's fun to, mm. it's fun to try to correct it a little bit. Yeah, but I mean, the logistics of some of these other ones are complicated, too, you know? I mean, it's not super easy to fly, and <laughs> so I understand I understand it being categorized with them, you know? I don't know, in a way. Well, and I think what happened, the, the reason it is still at least left over in Wikipedia is there was this publication way back, I guess, in the 60s, sort of like the Fluxus workbook, and it was a collection of what they're declaring Fluxus pieces to be. And they adopted Ligeti's three pieces I mentioned in that list. Mm. So I think that just stuck. As far as I can tell, it just stuck. But the, the thing you read on Wikipedia, like his brief acquaintance with them, it makes you think, oh, he like collaborated or at least talked to them or knew them or and was inspired by them or something, but I see nothing to indicate that from the couple of sources I, I dug through. And I'm just looking at the difference in the pieces, it seems pretty evident. Like, no, they're pretty different. Yeah. Anyway, Mark, you're I, sitting there and <laughs> we should we should we should definitely be hearing you. Does anything cool come to mind when you hear all that? No, that's, it's funny to me because like sitting behind a desk where I'm in charge of all the administrative things at work and getting to hear this kind of conversation. It's, 
it's honestly, it's mind opening because I don't get to have a conversation like this very often. You know, I'm digging through medical reports or digging through evaluations for uniform pieces and things of that nature. So honestly, I like just being a fly on the wall, hearing this kind of conversation. I find it fascinating. Well, I'm usually having these conversations with myself until every Sunday. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's good for me too. Hey, well, I think we should get back to something for Mark for sure. And I would just, you, you're such an international rudimental player. And I would just love to know, like, what, what is the scene like internationally, rudim- rudimentally? Um, I think the easiest way to break it down is because if, you know, you're going to have folks listening to this uh, and then maybe even trying to put it on pause and try to get any kind of information from it is to kind of break down maybe the countries that have a traditional rudimental scene that's vibrant today. Um, so, and just to break it down easily, you have an American style. Uh, but what does that even mean? In American style, you can have these different groups from all over the country. You can have from Colonial Williamsburg to the Northeast. So I kind of just put down some names of some folks. If people are interested in checking those folks out within the American style, um, one of which would be Dominic Cuccia. And another one is Jim Clark, uh, Scott Mitchell, Brendan Mason, and Cliff Barrows. Uh, those are a lot of folks who are very interested in the future of what the activity will look like here in the States. And if you go and look them up on YouTube, you should find some good examples of how uh, how they play and what their style is like. Um, but after that, um, in Holland, there's a really cool traditional Dutch style done by the Dutch Royal Marines. Um, it's very open sounding still, but they march troops from point A to point B with rucksacks, machine guns, the whole thing. And they're still marching to fife and drum uh, on their exercises. So that's a pretty cool thing to check out at the Dutch Royal Marines. But then there's also the Dutch show band style. Um, And they have what's called the World Music Contest in Kirkata, Holland. Um, Happens every four years, like the Olympics. Uh, Sometimes the DCI Corps will go over there and do an exhibition or compete over there. But they have groups from Japan, China, all over Europe. They go and compete at the World Music Contest. And... um, our good friend Casey Peter Volpehurst is a big proponent of the show band style, and man, Peter is just such a great guy that you know I just had to give him a shout out on here. Yeah, uh, thank you. Hey, Peter, I hope you're listening. We we miss you. <laughs> and so after that, you kind of have uh, you have the pipe band style. Uh, a big proponent of that you have is Jim Kilpatrick, student of Alex Duthert. I'm definitely not an expert in this scene at all, but I find it fascinating to watch them do what they do, how they play with the pipes, and how they uh, shape their rudiments and their vocabulary. But another one is uh, the French traditional style, and the Republican Guard that still plays in Paris uh, models their drumming style. They call it a core of drums, which is the drum line in front of the uh, traditional or the concert band that would be marching down the street like the wind band. They were kind of formed sort of in the style of like Napoleonic drumming. Um, So a lot of people have conversations about stick tricks and visuals. And is that a new thing or is that an old thing? And I always kind of tell people, take a drummer, stick them in the, in, you know, underneath a tree for four hours and say, hurry up and wait. They're going to take drumsticks. They're going to do silly things with them. So if you look at these guys who dress up uh, in these really traditional French uniforms, they have kind of stick fencing showcases where they, have stick tossing and they do sword fights and they're dressed as kind of Napoleonic figures. <laughs> um, yeah, but if you look up lo- online and you look up the French Republican Guard, that's the current um, military army band that's in, in Paris that plays. Uh, but then you have Her Majesty's Royal Marines from the UK um, and they have a very distinctive style too. They have what they call stick work where they bring the sticks up like this up to their nose and what they have is they have a soloist behind the, the main line of, of uh, Marines. And the soloist is kind of playing the beefier, meatier um, notes that are behind. And then the other guys are kind of just playing along visually and passing down visuals with the stick work. And that's really something that the Royal, the Royal Marines in the UK do as their style. But I think the one that I'm the most familiar with is the Basel and Swiss styles. And a lot of people kind of have those synonymous as the same thing. Uh, but Robin Engelman and I collect, uh, collaborated about four or five years ago 
on one of his blogs that he was doing about the difference between what we call Basel style and what actually is Swiss style. And Marcus Esterman is the historian for the Swiss National Fife and Drum Association. And Marcus is, he's a genius. He's willing to share all of his documents that he's collaborated on with different folks. Uh, he sent me a Dropbox file of about 700 documents dating back to about 1585. What? Um, and it's, it's all on PDF. Um, so, I mean, it's all, it's all open source stuff for people to share. Um, and it's documented military rudimental drumming from 1585 from uh, France, the UK, Switzerland, Finland, all, all over Europe. And it kind of shows the progression of how the drumming and like the dance styles in courts was also influenced by the military and how the Janissaries became part of it. And it all kind of was one big military community. But so anyway, the Basel style is kind of more the traditional style uh, in Switzerland. It's kind of more based around marches where it's a format of AABB kind of repeat kind of thing. Uh, and then you have Swiss style, which they have are kind of these compositions, kind of free form solos. And they have competitions on the Basel style and also the Swiss style. And so some of the people, if you want to look them up, is um, for Basel style is Lucas Minder, Sammy Meyer, Philip Meyer, Roman Huber, and Maurice Weiss. These are all kind of folks that are in this Basel scene that are really some of the best drummers out there. Um, but then we had Philip Meyer on. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what, yeah, Philip uh, oh, Ruscha and yeah. Philip Meyer. Mm-hmm. Forgot that that was a, okay. Yeah. So in, at the Basel Tattoo this year, it was very cool. Uh, we got to talk over with the Swiss Central Band, and Philip Ruche is the drum major. And so he's going to be coming over to Washington in about, uh, I guess, about a year from this December, because he's going to do a um, he's going to do a, a presentation for us, and then he's also going to bring his group over to the Virginia International Tattoo uh, in 2019. So anyway. Um, but those are some of the names for the Basel style. Uh, but in the Swiss style, I would definitely put Philip Ruche in the mix with that as well. Uh, but Ivan Kim is also a huge, huge drummer over there. He's producing students like crazy. Um, Roman Lombreiser is another one, and then Stefan Freiermuth. And arguably, when I see Stefan Freiermuth play, he's, in my opinion, one of the best drummers I've ever seen in my life. I've just, I've never seen somebody play so dynamically as this guy. And when I sit and like watch just how he, the nuance of how he shapes each little rudiment, he just gets completely sucked in. So anyway, those are my, uh, I don't know, top six or seven, I guess, Royal or, um, big rudimental scenes. I would say that are out there in the world at the moment with some folks that kind of produce, the current state of that uh, that scene. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, Ben, what do you got? So I had a question talking about all this international styles and everything. My exposure to rudimental drumming is probably a lot more limited than yours and Megan's. My, my background is like Wilcoxon and Pratt, and that's about it. <laughs> and mm. so from, from an outsider's perspective, I've always thought of rudimental drumming as a very American art form even though I know it is also an international art form. And my understanding of rudimental drumming comes from like, okay, there was the Revolutionary War where they had like commands and then they had drummers in the Civil War. And that's about it. So could right. you tell us exactly how, I mean, obviously Americans as we know them today are European settlers. So how did it travel from Britain to the U.S. and then proliferate from there? Sure. The easiest thing to think about is just logistically, if folks were coming over on ships, there was very limited space and giant church bells were very big and very expensive to bring. So instead of actually having a church ring a bell to bring people in for either a meeting or a congregation or some kind of community event, there was the town drummer. Um, and so if you look at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, there's the, the Night Watch Rembrandt painting. And in the bottom corner of the painting is an actual drummer um, from 15 or 1600. And so that town drummer would have been here with the first settlers uh, that would have ever come to the new world at that point, because they would have had some, they would have had to have some form of communication. So there's arguments on how all of that became 
what we call American today, but it was a European system that started that came over with the initial colonies. And then it kind of blossomed where you had Dutch settlements and English settlements and German settlements. And those would have also had their own styles back then. There would have been, you know, they have the three camps that everyone knows is just kind of this role based. Da, ra, ra, ra. That's a reveille beat. Um, every single country would have had a, a version of a reveille beat. There would have been a French reveille, a Swiss reveille, a German reveille, and now we have what we call the three camps as the American reveille. So as it progressed, you have American Revolution, you have von Steuben or von Steuben who came in during Valley Forge that organized the American army. That was a Prussian system that he would have used. So there's conversation about when you talk about the three camps, you inside of this big piece, the three camps, not just the roll piece, you have a tune called the, the Prussian, the Austrian, the slow scotch, the, the quick scotch. And those would have all been tunes that would have been brought in from those other um, cultures. So very long story short, American Revolution's over. We're trying to figure out what we are as American people, as an American drumming cult culture. You go kind of into the Civil War. The, Br the Bruce and Emmett book is kind of the Bible for the American Civil War style of drumming. And after that, you start kind of going into these veterans organizations like the VFW or American Legion. And that brings the kids kind of into this scene where they start creating what they have now is these drum corps. So really long story, very short. Um, European idea becomes an American idea. The Americans take this idea from all these other kind of melting pot situations and they run with it. Does it drive you crazy if I play Pratt on a concert snare drum? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I love it. I, I think, quite honestly, there's no there's no wrong way to play your rudiments when it comes to what drum you're using. If it sounds oh, good, man. it sounds good. Man, thank you for saying that. I just, yeah, that's that's good to hear. That's nice. That's the way to, yeah. Because think, we're all doing it. <laughs> well, it drives me crazy when we try to suffocate the activity by saying this is the only way it should ever yeah. be done. Yeah, yeah, well said, well said. Megan, what do you got today? Yeah, well, I think... Yeah, I, I think when you do that, this is the only way this is done. That's when traditions die, because if they don't adapt with the times, you know, there's 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 less of a chance of it being picked up and perpetuated. And it's OK if it changes. And it's also very important to, to keep the historically significant parts. But I think, you know, we also have to honor the tradition of moving forward as well and looking at the development yeah, all the tradition is is somebody's snapshot of when they thought it was old. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. Wow, I like that. So I wanted to talk today about the company of fifers and drummers because in my mind, this organization, although I'm less familiar with it now than when I was younger and in a fife and drum corps, it kind of reminds me of RPAS. And when I read you the mission, maybe you'll understand why. The Company of Fifers and Drummers is a nonprofit organization formed in 1965 to perpetuate the historical significance and folk traditions of fife and drum music and to foster the spirit of fellowship among fifers and drummers everywhere. So it really sounds a lot like the PAS mission statement for percussion. And like I said, I'm less familiar um, with the activities of the group now that I'm not actively in a fife and drum corps, but I can tell you a little bit um, about what they do. And the way I came across it is when I grew up in a fife and drum corps as well, like Mark, my, I don't know if you were using this textbook as well, but the book that I was required to buy in my fife and drum corps was The Company of Fifers and Drummers, book one, and then book two. And man, I still have those books and they are so well worn. You know, there's so <laughs> many, like I, when I smell those books, it's like, Wow. You know, it like brings back memories. It's crazy. And I just spent so much time in those books. So the Company of Fifers and Drummers published these manuals of tunes um, that are very, uh, seem to be the versions that are being used in a lot of drum, fife and drum corps in the United States. Like I said, they were established in 1965, um, and they were become they became a nonprofit organization in Connecticut in 1967. They have a museum that I have never been to. They have a company store that is now online as well, where you can purchase books and other uh, CDs. But they also have a membership base where they have a, a base of membership for fife and drum cores as well as individuals. Um, something that I have reported on on the podcast before was an event that the company of Fifers and Drummers puts on, which is a junior fife and drum camp. 
during the summer. And I never went to that, but I did. Have, there were members of our Fife and Drum Corps who went to that, and they came back very excited about other things about things that are happening in the community and coming back with tradition, you know, other traditions and new song, new repertoire. And that kind of reminds me of PASIC in a way. So, Mark, I don't know what your experiences are with the company of Fife and Drummers, but maybe you could share um, if you've been to the museum and if you know people involved in the organization. Sure. Uh, I actually am a member of the company of Fife and Drummers as well. Uh, and I have taught the juniors camp several years in a row. And honestly, it was great to see because early 2000s, we kind of had all recognized there was a massive decline in the activity. Um, okay. We kind of saw that a lot of folks were just getting older and there was a lot less of the young blood showing up at these musters and parades. So uh, some folks got together. Uh, Robin Nemitz was one, and she ended up organizing this juniors camp. And the company took it over a, hand, a couple years later, I believe. This is probably, I must say, maybe late 90s, early 2000s. Sounds about and so, right. And so now you have around 100 kids that come up to Connecticut for the week. Um, they get immersed in fife and drum tradition in Connecticut. They learn from about 15 to 20 different instructors that are all from the actual fife and drum genre itself. Uh, and it's, it's, very, it's very homey. It's very, it feels very comfortable. Um, it's introducing kids to an American tradition that really is part of their heritage, um, showing them how proud they could be by performing in front of people. I mean, I'm not sure about you, but I, I wore a pretty funny looking uniform growing up as a kid. I was uh, one of those things where you weren't so confident all the time walking down dressed up a little colonial green guy. And Yeah, so. and then you like walk past your high school friends and they're like, <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, exactly. It's an interesting way to grow up, yeah. So yeah, it's cool. It's definitely, it's a leadership uh, thing for the kids to get them some exposure being with other friends that, you know, play the same style of music as they do. And uh, oh, it's really, it's a very positive experience, those kids. Well, something I'm just finding now on um, the company of Fifers and Drummers Online, uh, .org is what it is. And if you go to the museum and you go to the drum collection, they have this really cool little spreadsheet. And there's 192, is that right? 100, yeah, I see 192 entries just on the drums they have. So they have at least 192 drums to share there. And what I'm seeing is uh, the number, the image, the maker, the type, and the core that I guess it came from, followed by a nice little paragraph of research notes. So if anything, guys, just go there and, and take a look. This is uh, it's interesting. So um, it, it seems that according to some of their statements, the company of fifers and drummers um, doesn't really, they're not about competition. They say that that's, that's not really the spirit in the spirit of what they're trying to do. So, um, but Mark, I heard you talk about competitions. Um, so I'm just curious about that. And then maybe about, um, what sorts of qualities adjudicators look for in competitions and maybe how that's different from like DCI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great topic. Yeah. So, Unfortunately, fife and drum competitions don't exist today. There is, I think, there is one in New Jersey, uh, and there may be there's a, a few small ones that are in Connecticut. But uh, as a whole, a lot of them have have kind of disappeared because of this discussion we had earlier about tradition. Uh, there's just a lot of arguments about what is the accurate tradition, what is the right way, what's the wrong way, and and a lot of things just kind of move past those discussions. And for right or wrong. Uh, for better or worse, those competitions have kind of just moved along um, because they would use kind of the the tick system, things of that nature when we were still when I was competing. Um, so I don't know if there's really a relationship between those two things today. Uh, when the company was founded, they wanted to be more on the community aspect of fife and drum uh, and the competitions were about, you know, who is number one. I have a question. Sorry, edit this out the silence because this is a horrible <laughs> segue. But I'm wondering, you're you are the head of the PAS marching committee. And so Hannah had mentioned DCI and we're talking about competitions and tradition and and, and evolution. What is your experience as chairing the PAS marching committee now that the marching arts have evolved into something so different than how it started? What, you know, how do you, like, what is the vibe? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I have to say this. I mean, the people who were dedicated to the Marching Percussion Committee are amazing because yeah. they understand that they're coming from all different backgrounds. There's pipes and drums, there's fife and drum, there's WGI, there's uh, DCI, but then there's folks that are just coming from high school or, or university level marching bands. Um, and so from a PS point of view, we're still, I mean, it's always a working experiment. Um, if we've got it figured out, there's something wrong because it's a, it's a living, breathing thing with, with people from all over the world that are trying to make something work. Um, and so at the moment we are actively looking at what the PAS competitions are going to look like in the future. That's always a topic of discussion. Yeah. Um, is it going to be something we completely model after DCI or WGI? I'm not sure if that's the right answer for PAS. Um, and so that's one of the discussions that we have is, you know, what do we want this to look like in the future? Um, versus what it looks like right now. And I think that's where, this is my second year as chair, and that's one of the hot button items that you know we tackle each year. Um, so one of the things we did actively incorporate with PAS being in Indianapolis uh, this year again, is this drummer's heritage tribute, um, kind of hearkening back what Raman Engelman had done. And so we try to represent all of these different international styles of rudimental drumming uh, every year at the marching festival. And so, this year, Jim Kilpatrick, we have coming in. Uh, we have some other folks that are coming in that are, they're not coming there for necessarily a clinic or anything, but they're coming as spectators and they want to play for, you know, some, some of the people that are going to be coming out to PAS. Should I bring my fives this year? Uh, that is a yes. That's every year. Is that, that's, I didn't bring it last that? year. Uh, <laughs> yes, bring I'll your make five. Sure to bring it. <laughs> Cool. And this is a personal question from me because I have a set of four snare drums and a, a bass drum from the early 1800s, uh, you know, replicas, of course, uh, on permanent loan at the University of Missouri. And I've been trying to incorporate it sort of into the curriculum. We don't have a regular fife and drum corps, but with my experience growing up in a fife and drum corps and knowledge of it and students who are like, whoa, these drums sound amazing and they're familiar <laughs> with the old guard and they're interested in history and tradition as percussion majors. Uh, you know, I try to incorporate it in the curriculum in some way. And so two questions. One, are there a lot of fife and drum corps in universities? And two, how is the old guard helping to kind of um, facilitate the growth of, of the activity in universities? Uh, you're tugging at my heartstrings right now. These are perfect questions. <laughs> so uh, to answer the first one, no, there are not a lot of universities that have those programs, but there are a few. Um, Ohio State, uh, West Virginia, Marshall University um, have one. Uh, UConn, I think, started one up as well. Um, but a lot of people want to do it as part of their curriculum. And so when I was finishing my master's through Boston uh, online, I was doing the program there the last few years. Uh, my final project was actually creating a year-long curriculum for a class in rudimental drumming to study how to do the research, who to ask questions to, where you can find different events. And so, I mean, I've created a Dropbox for these things. If people are interested in it, please message me. I'm more than willing to share uh, the research I've done on it, um, audio files, kind of a TED Talk idea that was kind of explaining why it's important to do it. Uh, but the idea is to try to create cultural ambassadors through your students of music through the snare drum. It's actually, it's a lot sim more simple than people make it out to be. Um, you know, if you play a paradiddle and I can play a paradiddle, we can play together. And you can do that with anyone from around the world. Yeah. Uh, but the second part is the old guard doing that. Um, we do workshops and clinics all the time. Uh, we have a request uh, format on our website that says request the core. And in there are kind of some stock ways to request the core. But then if people have an interesting idea where they want to email our public affairs shop and they say, I have this event, I, don't, I would love for you to be here. I don't ex exactly know how you would fit, but is there a way that we can maybe incorporate you into this event? We'll sit and we'll try to work out and hash out the details to make sure that this is something that could benefit, you know, us as the the army, as the old guard, but also the community of historical music in the United States. But we also do have a workshop coming up. Uh, the old guard is a juniors workshop in October. I think it's October twenty first here in Washington. Um, oh. It's also on our website as well. Cool. For, so, what is the, the target group for that? It is, I believe. It's 18 or 19 and under. So this is okay. mainly geared, geared towards high school kids. 
Cool. But but we're open if people want to come in and watch and check it out and see what it's about. Um, you know, there's just the people that are doing the hands-on work are going to be the juniors. Okay. Mark, what's the best way to study with you if someone wants to? Sure. Um, my email is jmarkreilly at gmail.com, uh, spelled J-M-A-R-K-R-E-I-L-L-Y at gmail. Um, yep, do lessons, uh, do things, workshops and things of that nature um, all around the world. I've got some lessons from some folks in Germany that I hit up on Sunday mornings, so it's kind of cool. Uh, and then I've got some folks just down the street that do the regular kind of lessons. And are you are you faculty at WVU? I am not. I've been helping uh, Professor Willis as yeah. kind of a consultant to get his program up and running. Got it. Okay. Yeah. To, to get this drum and fife curriculum going. Exactly. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I know. I know George, of course, from from West Virginia, where Laurel and I used to be. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I've seen photos of you and he at Fosnacht. Is that right? That's true. Uh, yep, he actually had gotten a grant written to take a few of his students to Fosnock. So I was kind of their tour guide, uh, and I brought cool. them around. Yeah, that's so that's. Awesome. I mean, yeah, if anyone is interested in that too, uh, definitely done that in the past. We've set some folks up with um, the Basel Music Museum has the actual drums there from 13 to 1400. Um, I actually, I think 1572 is the oldest one in there. Sorry, but still, you're seeing jingling Johnnies and all these kind of natural trumpets and things that are sitting right in front of you. So, um, yep, there's grant funding out there usually with research grants and so forth. And all of it is, is essentially it's, uh, ethno music research, uh, when it comes to rudimental drumming. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So on app percussion, we don't want to ask the regular questions all the time. So we want new information. So maybe you can tell us what is so secret about the top secret drum corps and I do want to know what, is, what is the secret <laughs> the secret is that it's top secret <laughs> uh, actually it's funny here's a little bit of history so the top secret drum corps had its 25th anniversary last year um, but it's also attached to groups that came before that there was a group called the Ratabangs in the 1960s and a group called the rolling sticks prior to that these were all drumming groups that would throw sticks light them on fire and do all these kind of crazy things <laughs> And so Top Secret is just the newest version of this idea that if you put drummers with drumsticks and you give them nothing to do for hours, they're going to throw the sticks around and come up with something fun to do with them. That's, That's great. The secret. That's the secret. <laughs> <laughs> From boredom comes talent. Yeah. yeah. No, but how, I long was, you been, how long have you been involved in that group? Uh, I actually I started in 2005. Um, I went with them to Sydney, Australia to play for the tattoo that Edinburgh was producing in Sydney. Um, and then after that, I became, uh, one of the writers and arrangers for the group until about 2010. Um, and so now pretty much I just kind of act as a consultant if they ever need me to come in and do some work with them, uh, go over to Basel. But typically I go to Basel once a year. Sometimes I try to go there more than that. Last year I went four times, um, but you spend, you know, you make friends there. And some of my best friends live in the city of Basel. And it's, it's scary, but it definitely is my second home. Am I right in thinking that, let's see if I got this right, uh, you, some of the tricks you do with Top Secret are also some tricks you do with the old guard. And maybe people think, oh, look, the old guard stole that from Top Secret. Or no, Top Secret stole that from the old guard. But <laughs> the truth is you are the connective bridge between those. Is that right? That definitely happened. If you look on some of the YouTube videos, there are people arguing who stole what lick from who. And uh, just <laughs> it actually just turned out that when it didn't work for one group, I used it with the other one. Awesome. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. You guys, this was so fun. Ben, Megan, Hannah, thanks so much for joining. And man, Mark, you, you guys, anybody, if you get a chance to see Mark Riley's clinic, you just got to do it. He's he's just, I learned so much being around Mark the couple of times I have been. And it's, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you more. He's just the sweetest guy in the world and he knows so much and you just, you have to, you have to tap into that if you ever get a chance. So it's uh, great to have you, Mark. All right. Thank you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure to work with you guys. Yeah, of course. Morning. Okay, everybody, we'll catch you on 113. Thanks a bunch. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Right, bye, everyone. <laughs>